suppose we can start. Uh, this is uh, Dan McCollum, and we are interviewing uh, Jeff Ward today. It's May 2nd, 2019 at the Ward Irish Music Archives. And the purpose of the interview, it, we aim to collect the music and stories of musical artists in Milwaukee and the larger Midwest so that we may share them with the future generations and their influence can be truly appreciated and understood. So, um, just to start, can you give us your name and maybe some of your background, where you grew up, um, how you came to the Milwaukee area, etc.? Okay. Uh, this is Jeff Ward. I um, was born and raised in Carlisle, northwest of England, just south of the Scottish border. Um, my father was a musician uh, most of his life. Um, learned all the ground rules from him. Um, progressed into um, uh, the uh, Cathedral Choir, my local town in Carlisle, as a, as a main boy soloist, boy soprano. <laughs> I, I, I can't hit those notes now. <laughs> <laughs> but I um, went from that into, um, into performing. Well, I, I was trained on the violin classically for four years when I was about 12 to 16. And when I left school, um, the violin wasn't really considered a very sexy instrument, you know, for a 16-year-old guy. Um, so I transferred to the guitar and learned to play that. And uh, it all basically just stemmed from that, you know. Got in, my brother got involved, my younger brother, and uh, we started playing together round about. And, and we ended up being a pretty popular duet around town, and then somebody else joined us as a singer. And so we, we took off locally. We, uh, we traveled around the Lake District and sang in clubs and pubs and things like that, south of Scotland, uh, over in the Newcastle area. And uh, that's, pretty, that's how it all started. So two follow-up questions. Um, what was your dad's name and what did he play? My dad, was his name was Philip, same as me. And uh, or I'm the same as him, um, but uh, he was a bassist, um, string bass. Um, he learned that in the army. Uh, he was in India for nine years during the war, and he played the bass, string bass, at dance organizations. Uh, but he played the tuba when he was marching, both bass instruments, you know. So, um, and uh, he was uh, he was a very busy musician growing up as a kid. I remember him walking around with his double bass under his arm. <laughs> you can imagine that. Catching the bus, you know, and they, they always used to let him stand the bass at the bottom of the stairs with a double decker bus. And some great stories about him on, and traveling around with his double bass. One of them strapped to the sidecar. He had a motorbike and a sidecar. <laughs> and he had this thing strapped to the top of the sidecar. Um, sadly, it rolled off one day when he was rolling around a corner, <laughs> and it smashed to pieces inside the case. So, uh, quick aside to the story, he uh, it kicked my brother and I out of the biggest bedroom in the house and turned it into a workshop, and he literally stuck that base back together again. He used to make this, uh, this glue. It was like toffee, and you melted it in a pot. And he was, had paint brushes and he would paint little bits of wood and he would fit them all together. And it played again, believe it or not. But that was my old man. He was uh, funny that way. What, what kind of music? <laughs> oh, he was classical for the most part, uh, classically trained. Uh, but he also played in little dance quartets, dance bands. Um, he... Um, that was on the double bass. On the tuba, he played with the Carlisle City Band. Uh, that was an all-brass um, band. And then there was some little bands spun off on that, you know, for private dues, you know. And uh, but He was pretty busy, I remember, growing up. But it was classically mainly. He was trained on. <clears throat> and what was it like growing up in Carlisle? What kind of, was there a large Irish community in the area? Or um, I'm, I'm sure there was. Uh, we, we didn't really get exposed to it that much. Um, this was a time, of course, you remember, there was no internet, there was no cell phones, no nothing. You know, a lot of stuff that happened, happened word of mouth. Uh, we never had a telephone uh, growing up as a kid. The only time we got a telephone was after Dorothy and I were married and we got 
a, a telephone in the house, which was really posh. You know, just, <laughs> and um, so there was uh, that communication thing was always w word of mouth, you know. So we never really came across any um, any big groups of, uh, of Irish people. They were there, though. They were out there. So we really we did sing Irish songs a lot, um, traveling around pubs and things like that. But the odd Irishman would come up and introduce himself and he'd say, you know this song you know, from County Kerry or something like that. But there, there wasn't that much exposure of the Irish population in Carlisle, sadly. Excuse me. So um, yeah, I guess the next question would be, so after, um, how did you end up coming to Milwaukee? OK, it was a job offer. Um, it's a long story. Uh, <laughs> we have time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, my my wife and I were on vacation in uh, in the U.S. We came here uh, to visit a, a pen pal of Dorothy's, um, and there've been pen pen pals for oh, dozens of years, right? Since you we were, <coughs> we were kids, and um, we um, we decided that we would like to take a trip, so we. And visit them. So we did. And uh, we were in a, a, a social situation. Uh, I can't remember the details exactly, but I got talking to this chap who was um, a, a member of the National Guard, the local National Guard. And we were talking about what I did. And when I left school, I, I was an apprentice, hand engraver and jewelry designer. And I worked on all kinds of precious metals and engraving them by hand and uh, and he said you know my uh, my my commander of the of the local national guard um, he owns a business like that and he's just lost his engraver through retirement old german guy he said you should go and see him <laughs> you know but i'm on vacation you know i really wasn't looking for anything like that anyway i did because i was curious to see what his business was and uh, I went up to meet him, and we talked, and we, she showed me around. Um, and it, it, it developed out of that. We came back home to England, developed out of that, and it ended up he, he offered me a job. So we had to start the process of immigration and all that kind of thing, and uh, ended up working for him. We got here in 1980 and uh, worked for him for a little while. Um, but. Sadly, uh, if, if you remember, back in 1980, the Hunt brothers, they tried to corner the market on gold, silver, and platinum. And uh, as a result of that, the replacement value of the precious metals just went through the ceiling. And um, the, uh, the boss came to me and he said, uh, we're going to have to kind of put our arrangement on hold in terms of what's going to happen after six months. It was like a trial period. And he told me why, and I totally understood, you know, I mean, he had to replace his inventory, um, no matter what it cost. But uh, I said, fine. So we, we sadly parted company, and um, I got back into sales, which was my, the second string on my bow when, uh, when I was in England. And I just started working for some companies, national companies in sales and things like that. And it just kind of developed out of that. And while all that was going on, of course, I was still playing music and exploring music and doing all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah. So, um, since we've already somewhat introduced her, how did you and your wife meet? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> no. Who wants to forget? Uh, it was uh, through friends. Yeah, it, it, through friends. We used to meet as, as a group on a Thursday evening. Um, uh, it was part of the after school thing. It was a it was a, a, youth, a youth club, brand new youth club that was built right next door to my high school, and uh, we used to go there, congregate as a group, mostly on a Thursday night and just chat and talk, play table tennis and do something like that. And then one day Dorothy showed up with uh, her friends and and we had mutual friends, you know, um, and uh, that's when that's when we physically met for the first time and it just kind of developed into a friendship and that developed into something a little more permanent. 
All right. Well, um, let's see here. So you've mentioned a few of the things that a few of the instruments you play, but um, could you go into a bit more detail about um, what, what are your major instruments? And also, what was it like, like when you got here with the local music scene? Okay. Um, well, I, I played guitar, six string guitar, and then that progressed to a 12 string guitar. I also play mandola and uh, bazooki. Um, I tried to pick up the fiddle again, but I'd been off it for too long. And I was kind of disappointed in that. I would love to have played the fiddle again. Um, and then what was the second <coughs> part of that question? Oh, no. Um, and this can be kind of two parts. You touched on what the music scene was like when you were a kid. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but I guess, did you continue to play play into adulthood before you moved here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In, in fact, uh, between 1969 till we left to come here, we ran a folk club, Dorothy and I, uh, the Carlisle Folk Club. And that was extremely successful. Geographically, we, we were perfectly placed. Uh, to get a really good discount on all the guys that were touring, all the musicians, and pretty well-known musicians as well. You know, if you look at the map of England, you got, you got on, the, on the west side, you've got coming out of London, you go northwest into places like Liverpool and so on, and then uh, into Carlisle, which was right on the border there, and then you've got Glasgow to the, to the, the west of the country, and then you got go across to Edinburgh. In fact, what I'm saying is it was like a great big loop Mm -hmm. You know, from London all the way through Scotland. And we used to get these guys that would come up. Um, and there was nowhere for them to play between, say, Liverpool and Glasgow. So we started the folk club in Carlisle. And it, it took off. Right? You wouldn't believe it. it was fabulous. And we got all the top line guys that used to come through. We got them relatively cheap, too. And it was very successful. We ran it for 10 years before we met. Who were some of the people that uh, played there? Oh, you and McCall played there. Ooh. Um, Peggy Seeger, um, or Martin Wyndham Reed, um, Five Hand Reel, incredible band. Uh, who else? Um, Martin Simpson, thanks, Dorothy. <laughs> um, Billy Connolly, um, Dick Gohan. Um, Jasper Carrot, <laughs> remember him? Uh, there were all, all the top names, you know, because it was it was such an attractive venue for them, because it, it was a good filling between the bigger venues north and south of us, and uh, it was. Do you have any good stories about running that venue? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was fun. Um, we we changed venues, physical venues, you know, at other times for one reason or another. But we always seemed to get get through, and we uh, we one of the venues was in um, a nightclub uh, in the bottom l l layer of a nightclub, right on the west walls of Carlisle. Carlisle's a very historic city, and the old buildings that were on the west walls uh, were narrow and tall. And uh, in the basement was this uh, of this nightclub. It's called the Pink Panther. Uh, we ran this folk club round of there, and it, and it was a good venue. It was big, and narrow, and long, mm. and uh, we had we had some great times in there. That was a good venue for us. So, um, can you re can you remember one particular good time that really jumps to mind from being there? Oh boy. That you can tell, of course. So, uh, yeah, right. That's, mainly, that's why I paused. Mainly what happened downstairs in the disco afterwards. Yeah, it? yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. The, um, yeah, the, the folklore was on one level, and downstairs um, was a, um, a discotheque. And it was a pretty good discotheque, you know, if you like discos. And um, it, it was all the people that would come to the folk club. Um, and they loved the music, of course, that's why were the, they were there. Um, but then, after the folk club finished, they all went downstairs to the disco, and their whole attitude changed completely, you know. And, uh, and now they were talking about all the modern records and all, of, all the pop stars and everything else. So, so it, it was a double-faceted kind of an evening for them, you know. 
which is kind of interesting. So then after you came down, came to Wisconsin and everything, um, how did you, how was the music scene here different than from what you were used to, and how did you engage with it? Oh, well, um, we d I didn't bother with it that much uh, at the beginning, and um, I can't remember actually how I got back into playing in public again. Yeah, well, there was there was a, a, a local bar in Racine. Mm -hmm. um, you may it may be well known if I mention it. Was it was a yard arm, and um, they did live music on a Wednesday and Saturday, and I kind of explored that opportunity and uh, finally got in and, and I, I played, started playing on a Wednesday evening, just me and my guitar, and uh, no microphones or anything like that, and uh, just turned, tried to get that folky club atmosphere thing going again, and it just developed from there, you know, and uh, latterly it's changed hands, but it's still going to be a one of the top music live music ven venues in southeast Wisconsin, and um, it's uh, it's a great place to play. And there's other places as well that kind of come along uh, as we moved on. So, okay. so how is it different, or was it different than what you're used to? Um, what different from what in it was in England? Yes. Um, well, usually in England, they were very, very uh, attentive and, and, you know, they would listen to the music and, the, and they would listen to the chat and everything else. Um, there was some times where they got a little rowdy, but I would just tell them all to shut up. <laughs> and they did, which was kind of interesting. Um, but then the Yard Arm, as nice as it was, it's a pub. You know, it's a bar, uh, great bar and good food. And it kind of developed. The music side of that was just an aside when they first started doing it. But um, it, it built up, built up as quite a reputation in southeast Wisconsin as a, as a great music venue. We also have McCauley, because we did a lot of bands from Irish country. Oh, yeah, JJ of course. JJ, JJ was a great was supporter of Irish music. And, he uh, started much later. Yeah. So yeah, he came much later on. from. And uh, JJ has done a great job, absolutely fabulous job with promoting live music in the scene and around. And um, he uh, he's had some great bands in his place, and he's, it's it's good to see that he uh, that he's still doing that and he's still excited about doing that. So what you, um, you said you took some years off after you moved. Oh, roughly about what time did you start getting back into playing again? Um, yeah, yeah, about 85, kind of softened a little bit, 1983 or something around about then. And then 85, we started to bring it back together again. And uh, I, I was joined by a couple of people, um, and we formed a little trio, little band, and um, keyboards and percussion. And we kind of developed some... Um, some uh, shows with them, and we, we started, we took it to the next step, and we, we made some um, CDs and recorded some music and went from there. And was, that was very, and from then, from 85 onwards, it, it, it just became great fun. Who did you play with, both in your band, and were there other local groups that you that were your openers, or you opened for them? Do you want me to name names? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, a gentleman, a uh, good friend of mine called Ron Weller, he was on the keyboards. But he had the technical expertise, you know. He had a, he had a recording studio, and he was a musician as well. He played saxophone and piano. And he played in, in other venues other than traditional Irish or Scottish music. And then... Um, um, Shane Mooney uh, was a percussionist, um, not just a drummer, a percussionist. He played for the symphony orchestra in the scene, you know, as a, as a percussionist and everything. Excellent, excellent. And um, he was keen and uh, to the point where he learned to play the boron and he got quite good at it. So that added a new dimension, you know, and uh, it was, we, we had a lot of fun doing that. We traveled all over, all over the Midwest, the three of us. You opened for Sharon Chan and yeah. Lisa at, in the scene. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Um, one of, one of, in fact, you may know the guy. Um, what do they call him? The Alf. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he sponsored um, a couple of tours from Lunasa um, and Shannon Shannon. Shannon Shannon uh, at at this at the Memorial Hall in uh, in the scene, and uh, we opened for them both um, when they played, which was kind of exciting. You know, sharing the bill and, and the crack behind stage with the Lunasa guys. Oh yeah, that was funny. That was funny. <laughs> Sharon, Sharon, Shannon um, was. Uh, we were talking. Uh, uh, Dorothy was talking to her, and uh, she, and I think the question was, "Is there anything you would like?" And um, she says, "I'd love a cup of tea." <laughs> so yes. a decent yeah, cup yeah. of tea, right? Yeah. So we. Um, I can't remember. Did you run home and get a yeah, kettle we or something? Home, we went home with a teapot and a kettle. Tea, teapot and some cups and a and kettle and some milk. And, tea bags and she was absolutely actually, delighted. She was. They actually took them on the bus. Yeah, and she so was. We always said our teapot did the shower Yeah, she, they had the big bus parked outside, and as they were leaving, they were drinking some tea and leaving. That was fun. Did you get the teapot back? No. <laughs> She owes me a teapot. Yeah, she owes me a teapot. Yeah, that was fun. So, what other um, what other towns and venues throughout the region did you play in? Uh, oh. We did some Illinois. Yeah, um, Illinois did a lot of clubs in Chicago. Um, um, went out to um, Grand Rapids, um, Illin um, Indianapolis. Cincinnati, um, Cleveland. Uh, where else? All the festivals. Right? All the festivals that were around there. Uh, yeah. St. Charles, St. Charles uh, Illinois. Great Irish pub down there. Um, not so much out east. I'm uh, sorry, um, out west. Uh, we did do some work out in um, Galena. You know that. Um, the, the place that we did that a lot. We did that for about three or four four years, didn't we, regularly? <laughs> um, yeah. So, how would you describe your music? Did you guys? I mean, what what genres did you play in? How did you kind of make those your own? Is that my style? Yeah. Better wording than I came up with. <laughs> my style, well. I sing and play guitar. You know, I, uh, I, I, I work with finger, finger style more than anything, <coughs> rather than strumming. Um, I like ballads. Um, I love the sing-along drinking songs, but I don't do a whole show of that type of music. You know, I like to intersperse them with that and some of the ballads, some of the lesser-known ballads from Ireland um, and Scotland. Uh, and anywhere else, you know, that um, I'm not exclusively Irish, Scottish, or anything else. I just kind of like to vary it as much as I can. So what are some of your favorite ballads then? Both like Irish and Scottish, and then some non-Irish, Scottish. Oh, let me think. I could have prepared something if I didn't know. <laughs> um, we have instruments. <laughs> Yeah, Galway Shawl is, is, is one of my favorite ones. The, um, I'm trying to think of the composer that, uh, that, that was extremely, he, he wrote the, um, um, what's a famous Irish song that about, God, my memory's going, I'll tell you, it's just, um, the most requested Irish song, and I bet you all know it. Feels, um, Fields of Athen Rye. Yeah. Of course, you got me on the spot now. I can't think yeah, of any yeah. of them. Pete St. John. That Pete St. John, I was particularly enamored with. Uh, play a lot of his songs. Um, Clancy Brothers, Tommy Macon. That was a um, great source for Irish music. Yeah, literally. Yeah. We met Tommy um, at one of the Irish fests. I can't remember. It was an early one. And, uh, was it? Was the first one? And we were walking, and it, it wasn't as dense as it is now. 
you know, there was plenty of room to walk, <laughs> but not bump into anybody. And uh, we were walking up, we were going to the north side, and, um, and here's Tom walking down towards us. And I recognized him right away, and, um, and I kind of slowed down, and I put my hand up and said, Mr. Make, and, um, and he stopped. And um, we started to have a chat, and uh, he recognized Dorothy's accent right away as being from the northeast of England. And, and here's the three of us standing there, and people walking past this way and the other, and he started singing um, Cushy Butterfield. Took his guitar out. Took his guitar out. In the middle of this, what well, is a walkway, you know, there was no <laughs> stages anywhere in the close. And, he, um, and we sang Cushy Butterfield, there's just three of us, right in the middle of that thing. It's yeah. That was, that was our fondest memories of Irish Fest. And every year after that, he always recognised us. Yeah, yeah, when we, yeah, whenever he was there, and uh, we'd go and say hello, and he said, uh, and I used to call her Cushy. Yes. <laughs> Can you explain that song? Yeah, yeah um, Cushy Butterfield. Cushy, I guess, is a nickname. Yeah, it's, uh, like, it's like a, a my, term of yeah. my, my sweetheart. Yeah, my yeah. Name, yeah. 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 I can't even remember the start of that song. She's, yeah. a, big lass she's a big lass, she's a bonny lass, she and likes she likes a beer. beer. Uh, and her name is Cushy Butterfield, and I wish she was here. Yeah. <laughs> and he sang it with great, great style. You know? <laughs> great memory. So when did you start playing Irish Fest then? Um, 80, 82. 80. Well, the first way it was 80, 81. So I think 82 or 3, 82 or three I think. So you, yeah, yeah, we've made it, we, yeah, we've, we've got every single poster that we, of the festival that we played at in the, around my basement wall. I ran out of wall space. <laughs> we've got to move some stuff, yeah. But, um, yeah, and, and it's been a great honour for me to do that, you know, I just... Great privilege, very, very thankful for that. Great, I love that festival. So, I would ask what your favorite memory is, is but I think you just gave it to yeah, us. Um, uh, yeah, those are the great ones too, but that one just stands out you know, in my head. When we, we'd already met Lunasa at the, yeah. at the yeah. Racine Festival, but they recognized us right away, and they always, we yeah. always get together and have a drink. Or... Yeah, but some of, the great, some of the old that are no longer around, you know, Paddy Riley. Um, um, Tommy, of course, and um, the rest of the uh, the rest of the Clancy brothers. Who else? Uh, yeah, sorry, Danny Doyle. Danny Doyle. Oh yeah, I did a I did a festival with Danny Doyle and Ian Ian Gould and um, Fiona Fiona Malloy down in. Um, Texas in uh, in McAllen, yeah, and uh, we the, the four of us were hired. They do a festival down there. It's it's an international festival, and each year there's a particular tent or stage that they dedicate to a country, and they get live musicians from that country to represent the music. And this particular year, it was an Irish tent. So they, um, they, they searched for Irish musicians, and uh, I, I don't know what their search um, com, um, compiled of, but uh, they must have come to Milwaukee. The year, the year before. Yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. And, um, I think Fiona helped. Yeah. It, it, was it, was it Fiona? Fiona, the, the Fiona called me, and, uh, and, and that's how it all came around. It was a great festival. And the, fa the four of us, and Danny Doyle came from the East Coast. I was living in the East Coast somewhere, and uh, he's funny. And uh, hell of a nice fellow, though. You know, he spent a couple of hours with him just chatting about music. And, uh, and Ian, uh, Ian was, uh, was great, too, and Fiona. Yeah, we had a wonderful time. Yeah. Nice. Um... So yeah, going back a little bit. Um, so what what are some of your musical influences? You obviously mentioned the Clancy Brothers before, mm -hmm. um, but what other musicians really influenced you both when you were younger, as you were getting into music, and now even as an adult? 
what, um, I've always been a fan of the, uh, of, of the folk music genre, it, it, not traditional folk as, as per se, but modern um, folk. People like Paul Simon, James Taylor, all those guys, you know, and um, I don't know if you'd class them as folk, would you? You know, I would. Yeah. Anyway, um, but those have been an influence um, more gladly, you know, learning new um, material from them. Um, even writing some stuff, you know, I've, uh, I've written a number of songs that, that I do on stage, but uh, no any of the kind of quality that Dale's guys do. <laughs> but, yeah, there's, there's some great writers out there, great performers. What are some of the songs that you've written? Do, do you write about any particular theme or...? Um, no, not really, but the, <laughs> the, the one that I did Right, that I like, and I play it more often than any of the others, um, is a song that I called um, The Dancer. And I was, I can't remember if it was actually in Dublin Airport or somewhere, but I was reading a newspaper, um, sitting waiting for a plane, as one does in an airport. And uh, I was reading this article about this girl from Cregan, which is just north of Dublin a little ways. And um, she'd come to Dublin um, to learn how to dance, to be a dancer, <coughs> and um, at that time, I think, I don't know what, what era it was, in the 80s maybe, but Dublin wasn't a very nice place, apparently, it was, it was a, a, a druggy town, there was a lot of drugs in, in Dublin, and um, not a great place at all, and she disappeared, you know, she went missing and uh, they never found her, and uh, I'm reading this and I think, oh, so. then her sister, a younger sister did the same thing. She came to Dublin looking for her sister, and um, she disappeared too. Jesus. And I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, "Oh my God, you know, this is weird." And uh, I said, "There's a song there, <laughs> you know." And uh, so I wrote this song. You know, she only wanted to be a dancer, and uh, I like it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on one of my records. Record CD. <laughs> well, these days most people just refer to it as a record or an album. Yeah. And the physical is a vinyl, so <laughs> drives my mom crazy when I call him that. <laughs> um, do, 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 do. um, yeah. So, try to figure out exactly how to word this. Um, going. Going off that and stuff, you mentioned some of your influences. Who's one person that you never had the chance to play with that you would just love to, and why? One person? Yeah, it could be more than one if you oh, really like. Oh, yeah, there's dozens of them. <laughs> I mean, jeez. Yeah, the, uh, if I had to pick what um, famous people or just people like me? <laughs> people. Famous people? It can be. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, I, I don't know. I, um, James Taylor springs to mind. I mean, it's it's far fetched and ludicrous, but I just I just love the way he s sits and plays, and the style. Um, incredible mu musician, great songwriter, and, and just a great presenter of his music. You know, he. Um, He's, we've seen him many times. How many times have we seen him now? Fourteen times we've seen him in concert over the years. And he can have an audience out there of four or five thousand people. And he can um, perform a song and do a song and you could literally hear a pin drop. You know, and um, that, that kind of <coughs> that gets you, you know, if you've got that kind of talent and that kind of presence. And um, it, um, you get so much respect for that, you know, because no, nobody spoke while he was singing his songs during, well, that's not strictly true, but certain songs you could hear him clear as a bell, and, um, but people paid attention. I always had a respect for that, you know, he, just an incredible performer. 
Who else? I don't know. See, this is part of the aging process. <laughs> There is. Yeah, there is. Um, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Uh, I particularly like on the modern side. Um, um, oh, what did they call? I forgot his name. Uh, played that beautiful song. Um, red hair, glasses. Ed Sheeran. And, and uh, I must confess, I hadn't heard of him until his record became a hit. You know, that, uh, that one that was big for him. I like him. And uh, he's got a nice, relaxed, easygoing style. And uh, just to lose his confidence when he plays. It's, it's, so speaking of that, because you brought in some of the more modern music and stuff, it, how do you, what do you think the... The Irish folk music scene is like right now. How does it compare to what it was when you were starting out? Has it changed at all? Oh yeah, I think so. When it started out, it was all you needed is is a, a guitar and an iron sweater, and <laughs> uh, and and a handful of songs, you know, and, and you were set pretty much. And uh, but I now I've noticed that as the years have gone by, um, the, the musicians are getting younger and younger. You know, and you, and you get some of the modern bands that are really, really good. Um, guys like uh, We Banjo Three, you know, they've been at the festival a number of times. And I uh, can't think of any of the others. Scythian, great band. Um, um, Screaming Orphans. I just love those guys. <laughs> they are fabulous. And really, really nice girls they are. And uh, yeah, we spent a lot of time with them in Cincinnati at that festival, That's didn't we? Hanging out with them, and uh, but the, it's it's the audience. I think is getting younger. You know, there's a, a lot of younger people there now, and I only say that because I'm older <laughs> than I was. So it's kind of a you know, um, and the and the and the amount of children that are involved. You know, the 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 dan the, uh, the the dancing. You know, and the, the and maybe you can help me with that. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a kids, more kids that learning to dance now than, yeah. than ever before. And I've noticed that. We used to notice uh, years ago, uh, you'd see kids walking around with the dance going to open. Now it's jammed with kids and, and uh, wanting to dance. And uh, I think that stemmed out of uh, the river dance syndrome. <coughs> you know? That was one of the highlights of my life too. When, you know, just as an aside, going to see river dance with Flatley blew my mind. But, you know, the, uh, and you see young bands. There was a, last year, there was a great band from England. What did they call them again? The, um, the young band that was, uh, that Paul knew. Um, well, he's on the shops at Flatstead, but the, the band was Irish person. Yeah, yeah. It was an English band. Just too young. My goodness. And they're just kids, you know, and you... You're watching these exceptionally talented musicians up there, you know, and you've got shoes older than they are, you know. So it's it, it's an age thing, you know, you, it, and it and it's natural and it's expected, you know, as you keep going along and there's younger <coughs> people coming up behind and everything else. And sadly, all the good ones are dropping off at the other end too, you know. <laughs> so it's a continue, continual progression. Are you still very active in the music scene? I try to be, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't travel as much as I used to. Um, uh, I have some physical limitations too, I'm afraid, um, with um, rheumatoid and uh, uh, arthritis, uh, both rheumatoid and what's the other one? Osteo. I got, got them both. Um, so that kind of restricts me in certain ways, you know. So I, I just have to prep longer. So, and that's that's just part of the process, you know. You, you know, you um, you get to a point where you, you can't function as well as you used to because of the aging process. You know? But uh, 
I'm still good yet for another couple of, <laughs> for another 10 years, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so how do you see the scene kind of if projecting forward like 10 years or 10 years? What do you think the scene's going to look like the, the, besides even younger? You mean here in Milwaukee or? Both, yeah. Um, well, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it, Milwaukee is the largest Irish fest in the world, right? And, and, and I don't see that changing. I mean, it, it, everything is perfect um, in, in terms of how the festival is structured, the site that it's on. You know, it's probably one of the most beautiful sites for an Irish festival. Uh, that, um, and it's just amazing. And I don't see that changing, or maybe, I, I don't know, but it could go another 10, 20 years at that, at that, at that location. And who's, uh, who's going to be around in 20 years, you know? <laughs> but I hope it's still going in 20. Are you planning that far ahead, Barry? <laughs> no, not that far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, it, it, I, I love Irish Fest in Milwaukee. It's my, my, my favorite venues. And, it's always going to be great musicians out oh, there yeah. that want to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, excuse me. So, we've touched on a few of your stories and everything so far, but what's one of your favorite stories about playing in this area that you haven't had a chance to tell yet? Oh, funny stories? <laughs> no. Funny, sad, if you've got more than one, you can tell them all. Uh, about, uh, not so much Irish Fest, but other clubs, other venues? Yeah. Oh, heck. Let me think. You put me on the spot there, man. Um, oh, um, uh, normal things that happen, you know, to... Um, I was playing a gig in um, Watertown. Or Waterford. Watertown. Up, up, up north there. Um, and I use a music book. You know, when I perform, I got a, just a music thing that I use as a reference. And it's, it's, it's kind of like a third leg, you know. You can really, um, and we got set up in this club, and uh, we were ready to play. And I'd forgotten it. I'd left it at home. So I called my daughter. And uh, this is about, what, two hours away? Almost. Two hours away. And... Uh, Long story short, she actually uh, went to the house, got it, jumped in a car and drove it all the way up. So, but which meant me starting the gig much later than we were supposed to. And um, I, I think I started to sing some songs that I was very confident I could get through <laughs> without having the music in front of me. And so we kind of, and they understood, they totally understood The people were very nice and it was, it turned out as a good evening. My, my daughter strolled in an hour or so, an hour and a half or so later, gave me the, key, uh, the, the, the book and said, um, I, I said, do you want to save for some dinner? She said, no, I'm off. And she went, <laughs> went home. Yeah. And one thing, and I'll I tell you another, I just reminded myself of another one. I mentioned Fiona Malloy. And she, she, uh, she's such a sweetheart. She really is. I love her very much. I was playing at a club in uh, Waukesha, and you would think that this is impossible, but I, I got parked up and everything else and um, started loading myself up, and I'd left my guitars at home. Not just one, both of them, because I, 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 I have a guitar tuned to D, uh, and one just normally tuned, so I don't have to do it while I'm just swap guitars. And I thought, how the hell does that happen? You know, and um, so I thought, what am I going to do? And uh, I had Fiona's phone, and I knew she lived close by then. She lived not far from um, and she said she Walker And she, yeah, last time I saw her, uh, she said that she may, you know, come to the gig. And so I called her up and I said, um, and she answered the phone. I said, Fiona, are you coming to the gig tonight? And she says, actually, I am. You know, in fact, we were just about to leave. I says, great. Um, could you bring your guitar? 
<laughs> she says, oh. Um, she, and maybe she thought I wanted her to sing, you know. <laughs> and and uh, I said, no, no uh, not to sing, because I need to borrow it, because I've left mine at home. <laughs> and she laughed. And bless her heart, she showed up with two guitars. And um, that, was, that was one of the most embarrassing moments of uh, my musical <laughs> career. But she took it well, and, and, and she did get up and sing some songs with me on that night. You think it probably happens more often than you think. Well, yeah. And you, you, you forget small stuff, you know, like a capo or your favorite plectrum or something like that. But uh, it does. It happens a lot. Mm -hmm. It happens a lot. So I've got a regimen when I, when I leave. I've got a checklist. Uh, not a mental checklist, a physical checklist. <laughs> so you, after a while, you get to the point where you don't trust the mental checklist. So um, and uh, I, I, I've got a specific place to put them in the van, you know, so that if uh, I can't see it, uh, that's a big hint that I probably left it in my studio downstairs. So, <laughs> But it only happens once in a blue moon, thank goodness. So you mentioned your daughter. How many kids do you have? Just one. Just one. Does she play at all? No. <laughs> she used to play the cello. But she played the cello in high school, and, and she was very good. But in fact, and, yeah, um, didn't she try out for symphony? She tried out. She played in high school orchestra. She played high school, uh, the Racine High School Orchestra, and she was, she was lead cello. And um, she hated yeah, she, she hated it, and I, and I can't think, how can you hate it? I mean, geez, your grandpa was a, was a bassist and a, a, a lifelong musician. Your dad is a, is a, is a guitar player, a lifelong musician. Uh, how can you hate it? What, where are your genes at? You know? <laughs> She's, I'm sorry, Dad, I just I, I don't have any interest in it at all. Uh, yeah, and... and yeah, she... And, and that's fine. You know, I didn't have a problem with it. You know, I wasn't going to force her to do anything. The decision was entirely hers. But her children, uh, or one in, in particular, my eldest granddaughter, um, she was an excellent piano player. Now, she, yeah, she was a great piano, but she didn't inherit my gene. She must have inherited a mother's gene because she stopped playing that too. Well, just that's because of she, her piano's here. Yeah, well, that's true, too. Yeah, she's, she's in Oregon and her piano's in Racine. So in you need awfully long arms to be able to play that, you know. <laughs> but uh, she's, uh, she has committed to me. She says, Grandpa, when, when we get settled and we have our own place properly, that uh, I'll, I'll get back on the piano again. How old is she? <laughs> she's 27. 27. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess that leads to... The last question I, ha I have, and then I can throw it open to Barry or Jeff if they have anything, but if you wanted to impart any advice to anyone listening to this interview about the local music scene or becoming a musician, what would it be? Um, get out there, you know, and just look, look around, go, go places, you know, even if you're not keen on where they are or what the kind of music they're playing, and just see what, get a feel for what's going on out there and... Uh, and Explore and uh, enjoy. One okay. One last thing. So, um, obviously, you put, you you've stated that you like Irish and Scottish and English ballads and so forth. Is there any genre that you'd like to get more into that you just haven't had the opportunity? Bridging off what you just said about getting out there. Um. No, not really. I, I think. I think. It, um, Getting involved in Irish music and Irish songs and Scottish music songs, even some English music and songs. That's 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 quite a that's quite a chunk of uh, of, of, of great music source there. Uh, but uh, Wales, Welsh. I love Welsh singing. I love I love to hear those Welsh choirs. But it's that language is just too hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I always kind of make that. Detention, you know, distinction in, in uh, and it's in, just in jest, you know. I, a, um, I do songs from Ireland, Scotland, uh, and England, 
uh, North America. And sometimes in little parentheses at the bottom, I put not, nothing from Wales. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's ever picked me up on that, though. <laughs> but I, I do, I love Welsh singing and uh, the Welsh choirs. Interesting. So, yeah. um, Barry, do you have anything? Yeah, just digging down on some of the earlier stuff you were talking about. You were talking about a duet with your brother and yeah, third yeah. person. What was that repertoire? Oh, with uh, Jerry, my brother, Alan, and um, Neil, a bass player. And we did local clubs uh, in, in Carlisle, uh, stretching over to Newcastle. But our, it was all, we did do some Irish stuff, but not a lot. We did the chorus songs when, it was, when we knew that we could get the audience with them. But we did a lot of, uh, a lot of pop songs, a lot of Eagle songs. Beatles songs. And what, what time frame are we talking about? Um, mid seventies, yeah. mid mid seventies to eighties, yeah. And um, Gre Alan, the, the, he didn't play an instrument. Well, if, unless you call a tambourine an instrument, mm -hmm. but he played it and he played it very very well. He, he got some great effects with that tambourine. And I played twelve string. My brother Jerry played six string, and Neil was on the uh, electric bass. And uh, little aside, uh, Neil was the very first bass player for Black Sabbath. And, really? uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, that didn't go anywhere with him, but he, he did sign on as a bass player for them. But, uh, and, and we played around uh, the clubs and, uh, in, in northeast of England and even out to Newcastle, some in Scotland, uh, for quite a while. And that was great fun, great fun. Do your brothers still play? Um, well, my, my brother Jerry has got a guitar, uh, still got his guitar. <laughs> my younger brother, Tim, um, he plays out. He's in a band, and uh, they're very good. And my younger brother, Simon, he, he plays well, but just for himself primarily. Or maybe he and Tim will get together. You know? But there's a, there's a, there was a big age difference there. You know, um, Tim... Um, Tim was uh, 12 years younger than Jerry, and then Simon was five years younger than Tim. So it was quite an age gap, and a culture gap too, you know. There was, but um, yeah, we, uh, we did all the popular stuff, and it, was a, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a club, it was a dance thing, you know. People go on and um, they do bingo in the break, you know. That you kind of, for the band, or? Yeah, we, uh, we started off as a New Eden folk. New Eden? New Eden, yeah. Eden yeah, the yeah there's a, the River Eden is a oh, major okay. river that runs through Carlisle. So we, we started off as a New, Eng, New Eden for, then we um, um, progressed into uh, Lanacost, uh, which is the name of a very, very old priory out in the country near Carlisle. Beautiful, beautiful old church. And it was named, we called ourselves Lanacost. And uh, we did quite do, good with them, didn't we? We... Um, we actually made a record, <laughs> and it, it's just a little nine-incher, but it was, it was an interesting story there too. There's part of Carlisle, um, very, very old city. Uh, if ever you're in the north of England, you've got to go there. And, but the modernizer centre, and by doing that, they had to knock some old buildings down between those two main drags that went north. And between Lowther Street and Scott Street, they had these beautiful little lanes, you know, brick brick floor, um, you know, arched entries at both sides, um, little sh stores in there, little knick-knack stores and candy stores and jewellery stores and everything else. Very old, very, very old part of the city. And um, the council decided to um, modernise the city centre and knock all these beautiful things down. Oh, and there was heck on, you know, they just... There's a big protest going on, and you know, keep our lanes, don't knock it down. Think of the heritage, da da da. And um, um, Jerry, my brother Jerry, and Neil, the bass player, got together and wrote a song called "The Lanes of Carlisle," and uh, it was very popular, wasn't it? And uh, they played it on the local radio and local TV, and we went up and we did a show uh, at, on local TV just to promote this as a, protest. as a protest, basically, you know. And we knew right from the day one it wasn't going to go anywhere. 
No, I mean, in, not in terms, I mean the protest, mm -hmm. you know. They're not going to take any notice of us, you know, the local council or whatever had already made up the mind. And they did, they tore it all down. Tore it all down. Such a shame. And every now and again I get emails from people back there in Carlisle. There's an organisation sprung out of that called uh, Photographs of Old Carlisle. And they, and they post photographs from turn of the century and, you know, pre-1980 when they started all this stuff. And it's great to look back on that and remember it, just as it did when I was a kid. You know, this, uh, did you get back to Carlisle ever? Um, when we, if ever we go to England, we go there, because my family's still there, you know, Jerry and Tim and Simon are still there. Yeah, we haven't been for five years. Yeah, but, um, but it would just be to see family. But I it, it, it had some happy times in that town. Tell us uh, a little bit more about your ancestry. I know you're from me. Yeah, my, um, my, grand, my grandmother, my dad's mother, uh, was born in, Car in Cork. And um, her maiden name was um, it's gone. Cody. She was a Cody. And um, my grandfather's family came from Donegal. Not too sure where, uh, but I, I did some research and there's an awful lot of wards in um, Letterkenny, up in that way, you know. And um, some of them had an E on the end of ward. And uh, so that's, that's my, uh, my dad's side. Uh, my mother's side, I have no idea. Well, Cumbrian Westmoreland, you know, but um, the, um, she was one of 11, 12 kids. And what was her last name? Her uh, maiden name was, uh, was um, Hilbeck. And she was from Kendal, which is about 50 miles south of Carlisle. Uh, lovely little... I used to go there for holidays, in the school holidays and things like that. Um, and that's as far as I've ever got with um, with them. But we did we did the um, what everybody seems to be doing these days, where you have your heritage thing going on, you know. And yeah, was it Ancestry dot com? There's a lot of them now. But I remember doing that. You have to spit into something and send it in the mail. It's, yeah. just, it's disgusting. <laughs> Imagine all these spittoons flying around in the mail system. You know. <laughs> no, thank you. Anyway, I, we did that, and it came back, and it was interesting in so much that um, you know it, it told you what. But it was it's kind of like benign, you know. I mean, it, well, they want you to go for the news. Yeah, that's what. They, yeah, they want you to be. Uh, like the amount of scandinavians. Well, everybody did, you know. And if you if you look at the history of the British Isles, they were invaded by yeah, Scandinavians yeah, yeah. so many yeah. times. Especially yeah. northern England. Yeah, northern England for sure. Denmark. Yeah, 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 and. Um, and you give the, the breakdowns in percentages, and you can you can get a random bunch of these things and look at them, and it'll all say, you know, um, uh, British nine percent or not. Um, what's the other one? The Scandinavian was a big one, uh, and then the other one was um, um, Spain. Yeah, but what what, what the, something peninsula? What did they call it? Yeah, the Iberian Peninsula. You know, which is Spain, Portugal, mm -hmm. you know, and that's all. It's just that, you know, it's just Scandinavian and the peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula. And of course, everybody. Yeah, yeah, right, right. You know, I mean, that island was invaded so many damn times, you know, so you wouldn't expect it to be anything else, mm -hmm. you know. And um, but the Irish thing is, uh, is, is, is the same thing, too, you know. I, in terms of population in Ireland, that's. That's relatively new. There was a point in 9,000 years ago, I think it was in Ireland, there wasn't even anybody living in Ireland. There was no people there. And um, so where did they come from? Um, did they come from Scandinavia and come right and, you know, pillaged and, and uh, wrecked England and moved on to Ireland? Or, or what, you know? And, but I think, I think that's actually what happened because there's nothing to the West, you know, nobody could have invaded them from the West. So um, it's very interesting reading, you know, to kind of come up with, with they had to come from Europe 
the, the very first people that settled in, and of course they wouldn't be known as Irish then. And uh, so it kind of developed and developed into in its own identity, in its own country, in its own history, and own culture. And uh, 9,000 years in, in terms of the, the earth is not a lot of time at all. What no, do you, do you in, remember the first record you bought? Yes, I do. And uh, it was by Paul S um, Sadaka? Neil Sadaka. Neil Sadaka. Neil Sadaka. And it was a, f a big hit. What the hell was it? Do you remember that, buddy? Well, he had a lot of I just think The very first one, I think, um, was it? I about 16, I think. Uh, six, six, six weeks, six, six, six no, weeks, 16. No, uh, I don't remember. It was, a girl's, it, was a, it was a girl's name. Carol. Oh, Carol. Oh, Carol. Remember that? That was the very first record I bought. Oh, Carol. Okay. <laughs> Tell me I'm a fool. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So, so, you were coming of age a little bit after the folk boom, or, or kind of between the folk boom and the disco era, or were you solidly in the folk? Well, like, you were in the, in the heart of it. If you were 69, you had the, the, the folk call, did you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, still well, it was, it, was, it, it was going very, very strong at that yeah. point. In fact, um, I, we weren't the first to start a folk club there. There was a club that was started um, in the um, technical college. And it, was, it wasn't organized in any way in terms of, um, of getting people from outside of the area to come in on tour. They did a lot of local stuff. And um, when, um, when we decided to do it, um, I, uh, I, I, I did some research. And uh, I found a lot of people, that's when I found out about the travel pattern, you know, that, um, uh, and there wasn't an opportunity for them to stop and rest and play in Carlisle. And that's how that came about. But um, the, uh, disco the, the, dis the disco thing was going on, but there was enough culture in, uh, in the border city, Carlisle. It was, it's about 80,000 population there. And... Um, that, that was interested in, that, in, in, in traditional folk music. And we used to have that, that club was packed every time um, that, we, we, that we put music on. And uh, they paid attention and uh, they, they'd come down when the big names were there. It was great. And um, it's a detail you may not know, but I'm curious how you paid them. Like, did you give them a room? Were you doing off nights or weekend nights or no, it's a nights a week? It was a, it was a Thursday, Thursday night. Mm -hmm. and uh, as little as we could. <laughs> we paid them <laughs> as little as possible. <laughs> that hasn't changed. It's a decent kind of, it was a band that we knew of. We'd put, put them up. them up at the house. Okay. Yeah, we yeah, were fortunate. We, yeah, we were yeah, unfortunate. Oh, they were brilliant. So the, they used to always the, say, the McCallans. Were the Corries going then? Or were they the Corries were going. We, in fact, we saw the Corries a number of times at City us. Hall, but not with us. But we did see them. And we, we got friendly with one, one or two of them. Um, uh, Ali Bain. Ali Bain. Great fiddle player. Can you remember the other guy? Yes, he does. Yeah. Remember the other guy? It was a, he had a duet. Yeah, he played with... Mike Whelan and, and Ali Bain, and yeah. And who was the, uh, the other duet, too, that used to come up a lot in the early days? Uh, he was an artist as well. Um, no, 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 no. He was a bit of a playboy type guy, you know. Oh, the... I don't... I, I take that back. He wasn't a playboy. But he was, he was a very good-looking guy. <laughs> tall, tall, blonde Danny. Uh, the Foggy Jewel. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not. They were very good. <laughs> they were very good. And, uh, but, but, but Danny... He was a bit of a playboy. Danny was a sweetheart. He really was. He used to knock 10 years off his age. Oh, yeah. So yeah. He used to say he was the same age as me, but his partner said, no, he's 10 years older than that. So now he's in his 80s. Yeah. <laughs> but they were very good as a duet. They were fabulous. He was a fantastic artist. 
Yeah, and he, he, his work as a painter is just unbelievable. Great artist. Well, they were big back then. So they were they were big at that Very time. Popular. Yeah, and we get some a lot of a lot of guys came out of the Midlands, you know, like Birmingham and uh, and uh, where else? Bolton. Um, guys like ba um, Bernard. Bernard Wrigley and um, novelty novelty acts, you know, that, that were all traditional in terms of their music. And um, they all did folk music, but with the spin on it. With the song. spin, yeah. Bernard, Bernard had a particular uh, per chance. Yeah, he played the bass concertina. I've never seen I've never seen anything like it before then, and I haven't seen anything like it since then. This concertina was like like this. And when he played it, it sounded like a, well, it was a bass concert, you know, a fabulous instrument. But he used to play all, he played a lot of children's songs. Well, his, big Nell, one, his big one was Nelly the Nelly Elephant. The elephant. Nelly, <laughs> that was his party piece. At the folk club, people couldn't believe it when he actually broke it. He'd been singing something really finger in the ear heavy stuff, and then he would pick this up and do so, Nelly, Nelly the yeah. Elephant, you know, and T for Two. He used to do T, T for Two, yeah. yeah. Mm. But he, um, he had this uncanny knack too of being able to, and he was, um, um, wasn't a, his voice wasn't bass, it was, what would that be if it's, you know, it, it, it could have been yeah. like a barrier, he had a beautiful voice, you know, but he also had this knack of being able to, in a split second, change about a couple of octaves. Mm -hmm. So he'd be singing and he, he had a, another ability he had was that he had a dead pan face. Yeah. You know, it, dead serious. You know, and, and that was part of his act. You know, and he, he was doing all this hilarious stuff with this deadpan face. But he'd be playing this song uh, in his baritone voice, and every now and again he'd hit this note right up here somewhere, and then straight back down again. And people used to go hilarious. You know, they just thought it was the I funniest mean, thing. Well and it never phased him. He just kept on going. That's that British, yeah. uh, the Bob, I forget right. what I would call it. That's that's right. But yeah, it's like, he, he wasn't famous over here, but you could go to England today and you could mention Bernard Wrigley, Brian and, Dewhurst, um, Brian, well, it's Brian Dewhurst, but Mike Hardin, Mike Hardin, and you people still know them and they'd still be on the radio in yeah. England. They yeah. play them on the radio still and do guest spots. So. Yeah, Jasper Carrot, British Beer Hall slash Dance British Hall. Beer Hall. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And they were all good, and they were all funny, you know. And, uh, and it's good to see that some of them, even after all these years, are still, you know, 50, 45, 50 years. Well, still. Bernard progressed onto that into into acting, didn't he? He got, yeah, um, he got a, he, he he got a permanent part in studio. Coronation Street. Uh, oh. Emmerdale, Emmerdale Farm, sorry, not Coronation Street. And um, a couple of other people that, that, that really made it too. Um, the guy. get an email from somebody who said, I saw Bernard on Emmerdale Farm. Like we would even know, we didn't yeah. know. And they, they were all starting out at that point yeah, too, you know, when the, in 69. They, they, were new, they were new to the scene and they were finding their feet and they were just uh, doing the tour and getting out there. And uh, it was a good time. It was a great time, yeah. 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 Good. Did you get over to Ireland much? We've only been three times. And we never went to Ireland. Until we came here. Yeah. yeah. We never went yeah. to Ireland when we lived in England. It wasn't a trend to go yeah. there then. Yeah. Now when you go, when we go from here to Ireland, it's full of English people in Dublin. Mm -hmm. All for bachelorette parties. Yeah. 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 They go but for we shopping met, trips and you know, stay a couple of months. We met up with uh, we went over there and we met up with um, Morris and um yeah. and uh, the, his band. Um oh, Stockton's Wing. Stockton. We saw them in Dublin. Did they ever come here? Yeah. Stockton's yeah, Wings? Yeah. Great band. And we met and a band also in um, the Daniel Fogarty Bar that we, that we met again here several years later. I can't remember their name either. In fact, it, they didn't have a band name. They were sessions. They would just do the sessions in that pub over there. Yeah. Two or three of them we met here in a band. Yeah, they came over here as a band yeah. and where well, there were sessions guys over there. But... Um, there's another name that we didn't mention earlier, Maurice Lennon. Um, incredible fiddle player. And uh, I, opened, I opened for them at the Abbey in Chicago. Uh, that was one of the places. And I played that, that, did that place quite a bit.
But then and when Morris came back to the United States, maybe in the last 10 years, yeah. maybe 10 years ago, he touched base and you did a lot of duos with yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. He started, he did, a, he did some work with uh, Irish Fest, yeah. good fiddle player. And, um, but he and I went out and did, uh, did yeah, about, for about six months, we, we did uh, some duet work out in the Chicago area, just he and I. Great fiddle player, holy cow. Well, yeah, his dad and his brothers, yeah, amazing. Have you played over in Britain ever since you moved over here? Or when you go back, is it just for family? Oh, yeah, it's just, you know, no, we didn't do any gigs. We, we just did, play, we, but it's usually because somebody's got a party together for the, when the three guys over Yeah, uh, yeah. Our Not our really. reputation is still out there, you know, <laughs> because people say, you know, if we meet somebody in a pub that we haven't seen for ten years or something, and say, "Oh, you're over on a holiday," I said, "Yeah, are you going to do a gig? Did you bring your guitar? Did you like, bring your guitar?" So, <laughs> so it can be a, a, a an asset and a curse at the same time, you know. <laughs> to be nice, if it was a professional gig, that people. Oh, nice. well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we had fun, you know, but. One of the best parts about um, when we were playing, we used to, uh, almost every weekend, uh, the, we knocked around in a gang, you know, maybe about eight to ten of us, and the girls. So it was, the gang that you know, well, yeah, yeah, I, I, should, I, I, should, I should soften that a little bit. But gang mean a collective group of people. And um, we'd go out in, out in the country, we'd meet, and, uh, you know, some of us, had cars and we'd pick other people up so uh, and we and we'd go out we'd we'd decide we wouldn't decide until we got together at the standing point where we're going to go well let's just go out to Armathwaite which is a little village maybe 12 miles away and uh, and we'd go out there and we'd find a pub you know and there was a few there was a lot of them around actually and find a pub and just go in and see what it was like and see if they'd be open to us bringing a, gu a guitar or two in and just doing some songs. And that's what we used to do most Saturday nights. And they were very receptive to let us do that. Of course, it was, we were never paid. Then, unless, a, unless, you know, somebody passed the hat around, you know, we got that. So, and we'd end up getting free beer, you know, that kind of thing. But um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and it kept us in touch with the music, you know. And, um, yeah, great times. Great Did times. Phrase church song or church churchy phrase or sing along. I should have known what I would say. Chant? Yeah. Huh? There's some, there's some kind of phrase, but I, I, I assumed it meant sing along. Yeah. Ballads and everything. Well, that's gone, Barry, I'm afraid. <laughs> if it was more than 10 minutes ago, it's gone. <laughs> Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, when you kind of became active again in the mid '80s, uh, playing gigs, um, if you were to come up to Milwaukee for gigs, where where would you be playing? Paddy's. Paddy's, on the square. Oh, not on the square. No, I'm thinking of something else. Yeah. Uh, Paddy's. You know. You know. But Paddy's. Yeah, it's off of Murray. 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 Yeah. Murray. It's Murray off of North Street. You, you, you played out in Delafield. Delafield and um, Walkershaw. Walkershaw, yeah. Um, Walkershaw, yeah. Um, Delafield. Who was that again? That was oh, the Carpenters. The Car Carpenters. Yes. Yeah, that was uh, that was a, that was a nice little. That was a. It was a very nice. Gig. It was a good gig there. And what then the, he also went to. Then his then he farm. moved, didn't he? He got his own place uh, yeah. somewhere else. I can't remember. What is it? What did Yeah, Connor Walk. Oh, Walk, yeah. 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 So, as I remember that trio, it's pretty fairly progressive for folk music, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? Which trio? The, tri the trio that you had, the Jeff Ward trio, the Jeff Ward, the Ward, Ward, the Jeff Ward band. band. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the piano, I think. Is the piano yeah. and, the per and percussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I, I felt it was different. I mean, yeah. in a good yeah. way. Yeah, good yeah, way. yeah. Um, did you feel like you were... Pushing the envelope more. Well, it, um, up to a point, yeah. Um, I think you could push the envelope yeah. more than mm -hmm. when you were by yourself. Yes, right, right. Right, right. But you, you were, you were, 
I don't want to use the word limited, but that you were kind of like constricted to a certain um, <coughs> certain type of effects that we could. Uh, for, for instance, uh, Ron on the keyboard was an exceptional keyboard player, but he also had all these electronic gadgets that he could make turn like turn made it make it sound like a, a full orchestra or a, or, a, or a violin or. Um, uh, a, a trumpet or an organ or whatever, and uh, depending on the song, we sometimes could add that effect in, like we do in a traditional Irish song. You know, you could put um, electronic fiddle on there. You know, with lots of effects, which kind of sounded cool. You know, it was as long as the tune was still recognizable. You know, um, it, and that kind of. You know, we did all that. And, and as far as the, the percussion. Shane was just so good at, um, at, at doing minimalistic background drumming uh, and the whole, you know, the, 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 the big stuff too. You know, being a percussionist as opposed to a drummer, you know, he just had that, that larger range of, of ability. As a, and it was different, you're right, you know, and, uh, but, and that was a positive for us. You know, because we, um, when we went and did a, a, an Irish venue uh, and we had the, it, it got a lot of attention because it's something that they hadn't heard before. The arrangement of the songs, for example, were a little different than they'd heard before. And, and it was, for the most part, a positive thing for them. They accepted it and they enjoyed it. So that's fine by us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, for playing yes. for no, music for the years. It was, uh, it was my pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity to share. Yeah, yeah.